Hello and welcome to another episode of Empower Apps. I'm your host, Leo Dion. Today, I am joined by Sven Schmidt and Dave Verwer of Swift Package Index. Thank you guys for coming on. You've both been on separately. This is the first time I've had you on together. Uh, this is awesome. Uh, thank you for doing this. Thanks for having us, Leo. Hey, Leo. Yeah, thanks for having um, us. Before we begin, I'll let you introduce yourself uh, for those who don't know uh, what the Swift Package Index is and what you do. Sure. So my name's uh, Dave Verwer, and um, uh, with Sven, I run the Swift Package Index. Um, I also run a newsletter called iOS Dev Weekly um, and various other sites, iOS Dev Directory, iOS Dev Jobs. Basically, everything starting with iOS Dev is um, <laughs> probably something to do with me. <laughs> Yeah, hey, I'm I'm Sven. I'm an indie developer, podcaster. Even most recently, we've started that together, Dave and I. Um, and I've been working on the Swift Package Index these past almost three years now, together with Dave. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, there's two other apps that I have, but the Swift Package Index is is really the main thing that I'm doing. So you you do a podcast? Is this uh, is this related to the Twitter Spaces, or is this something different? That's certainly how it started, yeah. So um, we decided um, a few months uh, ago now to to do little Twitter spaces to um, to basically just chat through a little bit of what's been going on with the package index, and then also to recommend some packages that we've seen um, flying past on the on the feeds, basically. So whenever packages get updated, we can subscribe to an RSS. In fact, anyone can subscribe to an RSS feed of those updates. We check over those updates every week, and every couple of weeks we did a Twitter space to um, to talk about those packages and also talk about what was happening with the package index. Um, those went down reasonably well, and we decided to kind of upgrade that a little bit into an actual podcast because we did get some requests for people to yeah. who wanted to listen to it in a podcast player. So. Um, so yeah, the last um, three, I think, or three or so episodes have been proper podcast okay. episodes, and um, we we experimented with live streaming to YouTube, and then we experimented with stopping live streaming to YouTube, uh, and now it's just a regular uh, podcast. Yeah, I'm not. We still do have a YouTube version, but um, but but the podcast is the main way. Yeah, yeah, I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, risky enough to, to willing to do live streams as well with with this stuff. So. Yeah, I commend you for doing that experiment. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, yeah, well, I'm glad you didn't go the other route and go to Clubhouse, I guess. So if that's still a thing. Right. Yes, is that still a thing? Even um, so, Dave, you spoke recently at the wonderful Server Side Swift conference that uh, Tim Condon had put up. Um, that seemed like that conference was a huge success. Apple revealing that they're open sourcing or making available the foundation library, I believe. Um, but yeah. I want to kind of just do a little brief redux on your talk that you did on how you accidentally ended up running the largest open source <laughs> vapor site. I love that title. Um, and so, I mean, one of the jokes that I made in the talk was if you put enough conditions on anything, you can win any competition. That's right. That's right. right. Yeah. <laughs> open source vapor website, you know, um, so so yes, it was really it was really um, a little bit of history about how um, the Swift Package Index came to be, um, how it was previous to being a Swift Package Index. It was actually a little um, Rails application that was a closed source Rails application initially, um, but then through a conversation that Sven and I had over email, that um, became the Swift Package Index, and, and it was an open source project from day one because um, we knew that if if it stood any chance of becoming really significant, becoming the place to find Swift packages, it had to be um, open source. And if it was going to be open source for the Swift community, it had to be written in Swift. So um, it was it was very clear immediately that we that when we were talking about um, uh, redoing, it. in fact, we were talking about redoing it in Swift because of various other conversations that had gone on. Um, but it was very clear that, it, that it, it should be a Vapor project, yeah. Yeah, and um, one of the things that I think you mentioned was the fact that, like, Vapor was 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 it at the time, really. Um, I'm not sure where Katura had stood, but Perfect at least had been discontinued. Um, so it just made an obvious choice. Um, 
Well, I think as well, Sven had some experience with okay. Vapor already, which was uh, a huge yeah. uh, bonus yeah. because I had actually I had actually started, I'd made a new Vapor project, but it was also in that period between Vapor 3 and Vapor 4. Um, I'd made a v Vapor 3 project because there was better examples and documentation. But then when Sven kind of came on board with some Vapor experience, it, everything everything changed from that point. So um, well, maybe maybe Sven can, can talk about it from his perspective. Yeah, I had been running a small Vapor 3 project before in, in production, like it was doing a real thing and I had good experience with it. Um, but also there was it was good documentation which I'd worked with and the Discord community, the Vapor Discord community was there. I knew about it, I, I was in it um, and I knew um, there'd be enough people to answer questions and, and I made heavy use of that early on and that was really helpful and um, at the time there weren't really that many other options you mentioned uh, Kitura um, Perfect which was sort of you know if not already discontinued on the way out mm. Smoke I don't think existed yet Amazon's Smoke and, and Hummingbird by Adam Fowler didn't exist yet either, either. so Vapor was pretty obvious, the obvious thing to pick if it's Swift. Spect, I had previously run uh, two Python services um, in Flask and also another one in Django. So I had some experience running that kind of service. Um, Scale-wise, I think that was also similar. But I have to say, in hindsight, I would definitely pick Vapor and Swift over these, over these backend frameworks because... Um, a lot of issues that I faced with the vape, with the Python-based services, we don't actually have in production. Like I remember fighting with Python and the service just dying, running out of memory, that sort of stuff. We don't see any of that with um, with the Vapor service. It's rock solid in production. Um, a lot of runtime issues just don't exist because they are compile time issues in Swift. Um, it works just really, really well. I think some smaller issues early on we had mostly around foundation not being exactly 100% the same between macOS where we develop and Linux where we where we deploy. Yeah. But once you sort of know what these are, mostly around formatters and stuff, you can work around it. Plus, your CI catches that. I mean, you're never going to accidentally ship that, right? right. In Python, that might be a problem. You know, you, you don't hit that code path, you ship it, and then in production you hit it, but the compiler makes sure you can't actually ship that sort of stuff in Swift. So I I think it, it works really well. Um, the, the, the other downside perhaps is that the package ecosystem doesn't have the same depth as it does on other platforms that are older, you know, like Ruby, Ruby on Rails, Python again, um, I guess also Go. But I don't think... Breadth is necessarily what's lacking in Swift. I, you might argue that there aren't many variants of different services, you know, to, to choose from. But of all the stuff that we've been doing, there's always been a package. And that package has, has pretty much always been really high quality. You didn't have like five to choose from, you know, three of which might be questionable and, and not maintained. But you had often had that one and, and that was good enough. Um, so... I mean, our service is probably not the most edge, you know, the, you know, on the bleeding edge. We're not we're not doing authentication at the moment beyond some some basic um, basic types. Um, uh, we're not doing image, video, uploading, transcoding, that sort of stuff. But I know others are, and and it it works perfectly fine. Yeah, talk to the folks at Amazon. Exactly. Yeah. I think yeah, there's Tim, yeah. I think there's two sides to this question as well. Um, the first is certainly Vapor and running a web application on Swift is a very stable environment to um, that to, to in production, and, and we've seen that um, over over years now of, of running the site. But I think the other side of it is that um, we also build a lot of stuff into making sure that's the case. So extensive test suite, um, good monitoring, good logging, um, and a lot of those tools really help that reliability it wouldn't be unreliable without those but it's more than just picking the right framework it's it's how you approach development of your entire service i think that that makes a stable service yeah and one of the things i remember Sven, when, when i had you on was talking about some of those libraries that you use like prometheus and snapshot testing um to make sure that the site is running and doing you know is staying stable 
Yeah. Yeah, and, and one of the reasons why I'm so confident that Swift is better, you know, from my experience with, as opposed to the Python frameworks, is because we did exactly the same things in Python. I mean, I'm I'm a test-driven nut. Okay. I, I do that in all projects because otherwise I can't, I feel I can't deploy unless I've run a test suite. So I had these in place and, and yet still, I see a lot of issues not appearing in Swift that, that did appear in Python. So, so yeah, that's that's my two cents on that. Yeah, and I think this is the year. If you're, I this is probably the second year I've said this, but like, yeah, I mean, there's no reason not to go with a server side backend in Swift at this point. Um, so is it the year of Swift on the server? Well, that was that was the episode I did last year, and I can't I can't do that again, unfortunately, with Tim. So. Yeah. Uh, um, this last year has been all about documentation and not the documentation of the Swift package index, but, um, so a little while ago now, um, I can't remember exactly when it was, but it was probably almost a year ago. Um, we shipped the first version of, um, doxy documentation generation support on the package index. So just a quick recap of what that is. If you have a Swift package that is already in the package index, and if your doc, if your Swift files have documentation comments that Doxy would understand and would produce documentation from, and of course you can test that locally with Xcode or with the Swift package manager um, locally, you can indicate to the Swift package index that we should build and host your package documentation. And we do a couple of things, which um, I think, in my, my opinion, takes us above and beyond, beyond even what, what people would potentially set up with their own CI uh, systems. So the first thing that we do is all you really need to tell us is what target or targets that you would like documentation to be generated for. And then as we do our compatibility builds, because behind the package index is a full, almost a kind of full CI system for every package where we verify compatibility with platforms and um, uh, Swift versions by building each package hundreds of times. Um, onto the end of that process, we tacked on the documentation generation step. So if package authors have let us know that there are three t documented targets in a package. As we build that package, we'll also generate documentation, upload it, and host it automatically. Like, literally, you don't need to do anything apart from, yeah. from, from it's awesome. what, um, targets. Yeah. And then secondly, um, we keep every version of that documentation. So as your package is uh, moved forward through releases, and especially uh, major releases, um, we we update the documentation every time you release a package. And then also, if you upgrade a major version, version two to version three, for example, we'll keep the old major version, the latest old major versions documentation nice. around and put it in a little drop down on your documentation site. So when you make breaking API changes, which generally get indicated by a major version change, we'll keep that old version around for you. And again, all of that just happens completely automatically. You just release your versions and that's it, it's done. So that's a, a very quick recap of what the feature does. Um, but of course, to provide that level of simplicity for the end user and also for the package author, there's an enormous amount of work. Um, and uh, Sven maybe can talk a little bit about um, some of the stuff that, uh, that we've, we've worked on with that this year. Right, yeah. So the, the doxy hosting, as Dave mentioned, is, is a tack on to the build system. And, and the tricky bit there is, you know, to pick which targets um, are actually the, the docs are built for, um, the uploading to S3 for that, and especially the proxying around because we, we're we adding a, a custom header, the, the thing that Dave just described, the bar on the, on the top of it, where you have a chooser of which target you're viewing docs for and which version you're looking at. Um, a normal doxy site doesn't have any of that, so we have to fiddle a bit with the structure of the web page to inject that. Um, and just to make everything work with us hosting that site, uh, you know, and and doing the redirecting and, and proxying of all those URLs. Well, I was just going to say, mm -hmm. the doxy building is fantastic on Swift Package Index. Uh, I've set up stuff with Netlify on hosting my documentation, but like the fact that you do automatically and like Dave said, has all these 
quirks with like major ver i didn't even think of that like yeah if you update to a new major version you have breaking changes like people might want to pull up the old docs just yesterday speaking of i put i updated an old repo that i had and renamed it and like i was able to get this doxy documentation working in minutes and it's fantastic um what that's great to hear. Yeah. yeah. And, and so you have, the, like, I want to jump a little bit and talk about um, when you add a package to Swift Package Index, it's simple. You know, Dave, you're a big fan of doing pull requests. Um, and that's <laughs> that's it. That's all you have to do. You put in a pull request. It's still almost working. Yeah. Just it's kind of there, it's yeah. awesome. <laughs> and, like, oh. um, that's all you have to do. But then there's some custom quirks that you know, Swift package index, like you said, doxy stuff. Uh, you know, we've talked about, I think watch kit testing, which used to be a thing, but now it's native anyways, but there's a few things that you can do in, uh, Swift package index to customize using this like YAML file you've set up. You want to explain what that, what purpose that serves sure. and how it works with Swift, pa Swift package index. So we, from the very beginning, we had we knew that at some point we would need ways for package authors to tell us bits of metadata that we might need to know that was outside of the package.swift file because obviously we get a lot of we get as much as we can from the package manifest and also services like GitHub where packages mm -hmm. are hosted, um, but we knew that um, proposing changes to the package manifest is a long and slow process, as it should be. You know, we shouldn't be we shouldn't be changing that file every every month. Um, but that we'd need a way for package authors to be able to tell us various bits of metadata that were not covered by that. Um, originally, I think the idea for the Swift YAML file came from us wanting to add author support, which we recently just added. So I'm actually just going to go off on a slight tangent. Yeah, for go a for to it. Talk about this. We, um, uh, the Swift Package Index participated in the Swift Mentorship Program again this year. So we had uh, two um, uh, mentees come on board and implement features. Um, uh, we had um, Sven uh, was, was mentoring one and I mentored uh, the other. And, and, and my mentee basically implemented, well, he did. He implemented author support for the Swift Package Index. So passing out Git history, finding the most um, the people with the most commits, deciding who was like a significant author based on an algorithm, and then putting that information live on on the site. But then, of course, with anything automated, it's going to get it wrong sometimes, or Git history is maybe not as accurate as as people, or it do, maybe doesn't re represent who actually mm -hmm. wrote uh, a package. And so we wanted a way for people to be able to override what the automated system had done. And again, we used the Swift package index YAML file to allow package authors to say, actually, your author information that you've kind of derived isn't quite right. Here's the string you should put to say who wrote this. So even though that feature has only just recently been implemented, um, we've had the idea for that feature a very long time ago, and <laughs> and and so we we knew that we'd need this package um, Swift package index YAML file to, to to do that. But then the first time it actually got used was when the compatibility build system um, was being developed. So we um, I think it was the very first thing we needed to do was custom targets. Is that right, Sven? Schemes. Um, schemes. schemes. Yeah, 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 it was schemes. I, I remember well, we were still, we had an open discussion. We had a disc an issue in our GitHub talking about what the format should be of that file. And you can imagine what that discussion was like. <laughs> you know, oh, don't use YAML, use JSON. Well, JSON is terrible. You can't have comments. Um, use TOML. And, you know, <laughs> while that discussion was still brewing, we really just needed some way of, of authors to tell us um, what scheme to use? Because you mentioned it earlier, there was one issue that you couldn't build on WatchOS if there was a, I think, mm -hmm. if there was a test. Right. Yep. Um, because of XC yeah, test, you had, a, and you you a had the example target. of yeah. the point free. I think it was composable architecture. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Right. And the way we in the build system, we had, we sort of had to. We, what we're doing is we're guessing which scheme is the right one to build. There are often many, and we just pick one. Certain heuristics they sometimes fail, and and people. 
it's less and less common, but especially early on, people needed a way to tell us, you know, ju just use this scheme for this platform. So effectively, we say, all right, YAML it is. <laughs> Everyone's going to be unhappy, but this one is, this is what we're going to choose just to get this fixed. And, and that's how this file was born and, and has lived ever since, um, pretty much. So, um, yeah, go and, ahead, Dave. And it's done us really well um, in terms of, um, it, we've expanded the amount of metadata that package authors can um, to, can add to that file over time, and that's also where package authors um, tell us which targets to docu uh, are documented okay. and that kind of thing. Um, and the main thing that this, this, there's two main advantages of doing this file in this way, is we could have made a system where package authors needed to authenticate on packageindex.com, log in, and maybe they get a web view where they can say, oh, it's these targets, and it's, you know, this is the correct author information, and that kind of thing. But because everything comes from a Git repository. That's the source of truth for everything. To, to have some of the metadata live somewhere else, maybe behind a specific site, never really felt right to me. And to have that as a YAML file in the package repository um, feels like the right solution. It also means that any other tools can also look at that file because it's just a file in a Git repository. Um, I think, as far as I'm aware, we're the only we're the only um, app that does look at that file. Uh, but certainly, it felt right to have that metadata live in the package repository. Um, of course, there are downsides to it because it's much more difficult to tell people that they should go looking at the package YAML um, documentation and actually just to go off on another tangent. Go for it. The other um, Swift mentorship project um, that Sven ran um, <laughs> with his mentee. Um, was to document that file. So maybe you can talk about a bit about that, Sven. Yeah, I mean, this has been... Uh, this this popped up quite a few times that people, you know, knew there was this file, but they didn't know what the format was, what the, what the actual things are that you can put in it. And we had a blog post that introduced it and a couple of bits and bobs here and there, but no central place to actually host more document. I mean, the obvious central place is, is obviously the package index, but we never actually put up a, a page on it that explained that file better. And then we kind of thought, well, we, we had just built a doc system and we had pushed all of the, the specs that, that like the, the SPI YAML file is actually um, the codable struct that is behind it is in a separate package that we have in the in our GitHub. So it's Swift package index slash okay. SPI manifest. And the package is actually in the index. And then the obvious thing was to just add documentation, docc documentation, have it generated through the index, and then point you know, towards that documentation in the index. And that's what um, Ahmad Yasser Yasa, uh, worked towards, actually in, um, adding docs to that package such that we can host it and then direct people towards that file and have nice. it has examples now it shows you know what things you can do yeah. how you add to, I actually I mean that's the thing I had snippets lying around to tell people what to do and now finally I can <laughs> I can look it up did you, myself did you like did you really deep dive into Doxy and like do tutorials and articles and things like that or did you just stick, stay with like document like just swift comments yeah, it's, it's this is just a it has a intro just markdown yeah, pages. Yeah. I mean, okay. it's obviously the the struct is documented to a certain degree, but the main documentation for this kind of thing has to be a markdown yeah. file describing well, what the purpose is and and you know I think the the most interesting page there is common use cases where we describe, yeah. you know, what do I do if I want to override the scheme? Okay. What do I do if I want to override the target? How to add documentation? That sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because those are the the main the main questions people ask. Was there anything else you want to talk about concerning the Swift package index YAML file? We covered authors. We covered documentation so. yeah, targets. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. So, um, one of the big improvements it sounds like you want to do this year is to searching on the site. Uh, do you want to explain how it works now and? what you're hoping to do in 2023? Well, I think actually, um, I think what you're potentially referring to is a change that we've already made. And again, this was a, um, this was a, a, a contribution uh, to the open source project um, from Joe Heck. Um, so 
Um, Joe noticed some uh, problems when he was searching for, um, I think, was he searching for ping or FTP? One of the okay. two. Um, yeah, both of them. Yeah, those were both the two of those. Yeah. Those are the two. Yeah, th those are the two problems. Um, both of those have um, very ambiguous. Um, uh, not ambiguous. That's the wrong word. But um, they. Both of those phrases occur in lots yeah. of other words in ways that you wouldn't imagine. Yes. Um, and it was putting potentially terrible search results to the top of the list. Um, and so he originally reported it as a as an issue and we talked about it a little bit but he was also interested in um in in doing some work to to solve it and he did some amazing work with um looking at some of the postgres um search commands and um i forget the name of the uh technology maybe sven remembers what are um, the things that they're broken up stemming. into heuristics okay yeah stemming and stemming. there was something else as well i can't remember what it was yeah um and, and so that landed uh, a few months ago now. Um, and what it does in, in real terms is make vastly improved um, uh, search nice. results where if you type FTP, it's more, much more likely now to show you things that are about FTP instead of that being part of some of the okay. word. That's really yeah, cool. Yeah, just maybe to explain by, by example what the problem was. So if it, imagine you search for, for ping. You get all sorts of hits for mapping you know, ing being, or uh, ping being a okay. very common ending. FTP, likewise, Swift package, FTP, mm. Swift FTP package. Yeah, right. You know, when that's spelled together, you get hits like that. They have nothing to do with what you were actually looking for. So what you can do is have run an index um, that does word stemming. So it, it breaks up words and, and discards endings that aren't actually, you know, part of, part of the word, mm -hmm. really. Right. Um, and that then gives you good search results if you if you rank by those. It was a bit more complicated than that because we had to weave it into our existing search and our you know we want to preserve a lot of aspects of our mm -hmm. of our current search. Um, but um, Joe did a lot of work. I mean, really Joe did. actually wrote a Swift UI app that exercised that that took searches that he'd run, which he'd capt captured. So he captured the ranking, had a Swift UI app to actually look at those results and to compare them. He he went all in on that feature. That's awesome. It was amazing. Is this and, and this uh, all works yeah, within it, Vapor and Fluent, or like was there some customization in there? So what saves us here is that you can drop down to pure SQL. Okay. I mean, I, I'm sure you right. could potentially write this in. Not in Fluent, but in there's there are other layers in Vapor uh, below Fluent, right, right, right. Um, SQL right. Kit, for instance, where you can, you know, write your func um, SQL functions and then assemble them. But in this case, in Search, we're really assembling. Yeah. Well, we're using we're using SQL Kit, but a lot of SQL raw as well that we then assemble. Um, and uh, that's how we build up the, the search string, and it, uh, it's effectively going through a materialized view um, just to keep it fast. Yeah, that uh, makes total sense. But this sort of stuff you can't you can't do with Fluent. Yeah, yeah, but you can get into the raw SQL, which sounds like what you guys did, and it makes sense yeah. with search. Um, go ahead, and, Dave. And the nice thing to uh, about being able to talk about this on on the podcast is that that kind of work that Joe did on that is really thankless. Like. He did an enormous amount of work to get that pull request in and 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 to improve the search on the site. And to anybody using the site, it still just produces search results, right? You only that that's the kind of change where um, you only really notice when it goes wrong. And it the fact that nobody noticed is is a great testament to how good that change from Joe was. Yeah, that's all, that's awesome. Yeah. So one of the other things you've talked about quite a bit is the whole, um, we, we just got this whole infrastructure, I believe it was June of this year, uh, with Swift package plugins. What, what are you doing with Swift package plugins and Swift package index and how, how, how do those two, what's their relationship, I guess? Um, well, we've, We've sort of we, we've passed this uh, package manifest the whole time, and, and plugins are a new type of product that appeared um, when they when they came live. 
but initially we were blind to them because they weren't a prototype we knew. Um, so we had to uh, had to change that to actually ingest them. Um, but I think that happened pretty early on because, if I recall correctly, not passing them led to you know the packages with plugins actually failing to index. So that was an obvious thing to do. But uh, one of the things, and I was also a, a uh, contributor um, contributing that change, uh, Marin uh, Todorov, um, and that was support for plugin search. Um, so you, you may not know, you we have certain extensions on search. You can obviously search for terms, but you can also apply little um, qualifiers. Okay. So for instance, platform colon iOS, mm. which you know lists packages that are compatible with iOS. Mm. But we also have, um, I think it's, I don't even know, is it called just product colon? I think, I think it's yeah. product colon and then executable product colon library and then product colon mine plugin? Um, added the support for product colon plugin and then you can search for for uh, plugins you know you can just search for product colon plugin that lists you all the pla- the plugins um, packages with plug- plugins that the package index knows about and you can obviously add other search terms in addition to that to, f- to filter that down further. Uh, so that was really cool because that allowed us early on to to see you know to expose what um, what plugins they actually are and see them you know the list grow over the months as they as they started appearing. What are some quirks that you found with plugins that you didn't have to run into besides just the new product type? I guess. Yeah, I I don't think there were any problems okay. really. I mean, well, actually, let me qualify that. <laughs> One issue that is is there now that I think of it that is there, and I I don't think there's a, an obvious fix, is uh, compatibility of plugins. Okay. Because, mm. what do you actually build? Um, we currently build a package to to determine compatibility. I'm not actually sure what happens if you run Swift build on a pure plugin package. Will okay. it just will it actually build anything? Um, would you actually need to use it to to determine compatibility? I'm I'm a bit hazy on what would actually happen, but I do recall right, that right. we had packages uh, being flagged and people said, "Well, is, this should be compatible, but sort of isn't doing the thing." But I think they had something. An example in in their repository that we then built, but the plugin was actually you know uh, attached to that. Uh, so I'm not sure what the state there is. I don't think it's a currently not a common enough problem to be to be an issue. Um, you know because you sort of, I mean, plugins are sort of a dependency when you use them, mm-hmm. right? But then you can also not because they they do something in your project, but they're mostly not part of your your built product in the end, right? There's no, normally, there's no code that lands in your in your package from the plugin unless the plugin somehow, you know, transforms code and that that's then gets added. Um, so I think they're, they're a bit weird. Right, right. In, in terms of are they, are they dependencies in, in that sense? Yeah. And how do you test for compatibility in that sense, I guess? Yeah. And I think the other thing with compatibility around plugins is it's never going to be easy or potentially never even going to be possible to represent the full spectrum of compatibility of every part of every package. Is this plugin compatible with this platform? Like even just representing that data would be extremely challenging. And then for people to, to, to read that data and, and get what they need from it also needs to be relatively right. simple. And I, I, would, I think in, in my head at least, what we have right now with that grid is at the very top end of how complex we want compatibility to look. I would not want it to be any more complex than it currently is. In fact, I would like to simplify that a little bit if we can over time. Right, right, and that makes sense. And so, yes, we may not capture some of the intricacies of, well, this package is compatible with iOS, but this plugin needs macOS or, you know, whatever. There are are always going to be things there that we might not be able to represent. Um, to people who are looking for a package. Um, and so there's a limit to how far we can really go down that path, or at least how far we can go without making things too complex. Right. Yeah, exactly. So I want to talk a little bit about the future of the Swift package index. Uh, in our last episode, I had a Vander on, and one of the things we were talking about is like um, registry is becoming more and more wide known and used. And it sounds like you're doing something with that. 
for Swift Packet Package Index in 2023? Right, yeah. So um, I think 2023 will be the, the, the year that people start to hear a little bit more about package registries. Um, package registries have been, or the idea for a package registry in Swift has been yeah. around for a few years now. And in fact, in 5.7, the client, the Swift Package Manager client, gained full support for package registries. Nice. But it's probably worth talking a little bit about what the difference is between a package registry and a package index before we go too further, too much further, because that's certainly going to be something that people may not have been aware of yet, because package registries have been, you would have heard of them if you were like super in the weeds on package manager, but most people are just using packages, yeah. right? And they just put a git URL in and off it goes and everything works. So. A package registry, and there can be multiple package registries. The Swift package manager supports multiple package registries. So GitHub could run a package registry. Apple could run a package registry. Amazon could run a package registry. Brightdigit could run their own internal package registry. You're in my mind. Um, yeah, I was you, just thinking the, about the, that. I was like, yeah, <laughs> I should try that out. <laughs> the, 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 the concept of a registry is... Is no, there's no centralized uh, place by definition um, uh, for a registry. And the registry takes care of all the hard stuff, basically. So it takes care of delivering package uh, data. Um, it takes care of um, uh, verifying that the contents of package data is is signed and secure and, and verifiably uh, not tampered with since the package author um, uh, kind of uh, certified it, which is a problem that is currently the current implementation of the uh, package manager has that problem where basically if you tag a version in Git, um, that's the version that the package manager takes as a specific version. But with Git tags, they're mutable. Right. So you could move a tag around and, and potentially, uh, you know, one person who's using your package at this version has different code to another person that's using as somebody who's obviously. developed swift packages i've run i've done i've tagged something and then been like oh crap like uh i forgot to do right. this and this and then i have to go in and i have to delete my whole package mm. cache which is horrible if you've ever done that don't ever do that unless you absolutely sure. need mm -hmm. to on your machine um but yeah i've totally mm -hmm. I, I totally know where you're coming from on that so package registries are going to solve a lot of these problems um but they, it'll mean that you're no longer putting Git URLs into your package manifest because instead of getting it from a Git repository, you'll be getting the package from a package registry. Mm. Um, and so there's some changes, you know, I mean, th th these are these changes, even though they're supported by the current version of package manager, they're probably a little way down the road because what Apple announced recently was that they are going to build a um, an implementation of the package, a package registry server um, that that will be compatible with the package manager. So but Apple are open source developing this package. The registry. only catch is they get fifteen percent. So you know, I don't know if you, you <laughs> want to use that registry. Sorry, I had I to make that joke. Fifteen percent. I had to make that joke. Fifteen percent of all the, the of all the uh, For, revenue right, that goes to open source right, isn't right. actually that much. <laughs> Somebody, one of the one of the owners, Sadly. is just like, oh yeah, that's a good idea without any knowledge of you know that's open source. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit different to the uh, App Store where uh, <laughs> where it is a, a a platform based on transactions. Open source software is, is a little different than that. <laughs> um, so, what, how, what where does that leave the package index? Um, the good news is we are going to fully support package registries as soon as they uh, become uh, a thing that's out in the wild. Um, so we will obviously have to, and the Swift Package Manager will also continue to support Git URLs. I I can imagine it's going to support Git URLs probably forever. Yeah, hopefully. I, I, um, I just uh, sort of segue question, but like one of the things yeah. I've found with a lot of other registries out there, well, not registries, but other languages especially npm um and i know cocopods had run into this too is like anytime you have one central registry there's always like room for trouble and what i've liked about swift is that it relies and you probably like this too but like it relies on git repo urls whereas like um so it sounds to me like what, what you're saying is like a registry you can add that as a dependency with like some 
you know, qualifier saying that it's this specific package in this registry as opposed to the GitHub URL. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and then it'll pull in, so the, the, they'll still, we will, we will still use Git repositories to store our source code, but there will, there will now be this kind of intermediate step and how that all falls out is probably we're probably a little bit premature talking about yeah, that yeah. now because we we, ha we haven't seen what they're going to develop um but the package index is going to be a centralized way uh, um, uh, place because at some point if you're going to deal with discovery and search for multiple package registries you need to have one place where all of those registries can be searched. Otherwise, you'd need to go, if you were looking for a package, you'd need to go to each mm -hmm. registry. Uh, not that search is even a part of a registry. It's not part of the, the registry spec. It search, is not, um, search is not there. So we'll still need something to gather metadata from Git URLs and package registries, bring it all together and make it searchable and allow packages to be discovered um, no matter where they're hosted. Awesome. And that's what we'll take. That's care awesome. Of. Yeah, uh, I haven't dived into, but now I think I might dive into registries and how they work. Um, but and it like that, I think will increase obviously your audience. I assume your audience continues to grow. You can see that, right? Um, and people are using Swift packages more and more. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, oh. I, I, we, we've seen consistent and and steady growth. Um, ever since we launched really and in fact i was just looking at something earlier today and our traffic has increased by over 50 percent since august last year wow um so we're growing we're, we're, we're growing really nicely which is great what and that i mean that i think proves two things it proves that what we're producing is useful but it also i think mirrors the adoption of swift package manager i think as we go through um you know coca pods was and still is totally dominant in terms of um, iOS and macOS projects. It was just that was the way that you imported. Carthage was there as well, but I, Carthage never really got the adoption that Cocoa Pods did. Um, and and I think we can see um, quite clearly now that Package Manager is is gaining huge amounts of adoption. CocoaPods is going to be around for a very, very long time because there are lots of projects that will not upgrade until there's a reason that they have to upgrade. Right, right. Um, you still have Objective-C uh, stuff project, out, that will be out there. Yeah. If you have anything that's Objective-C based, like you have to be on CocoaPods. That's it. There's nothing out there. But I think we're certainly seeing Package Manager take more share of that um, market yep. now. Yep, yep. Um, Anything else you want to talk about that's coming out this year? Um, I think we could talk a little bit about maybe what we're... Um, yeah, well, yeah, let's talk a little bit about what we're planning to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, yeah. yeah, I think one thing that... that Oh, sorry, go on, Sam. No, I was just uh, maybe picking up on the Doxy stuff that we talked about earlier because um, that's seen a lot of adoption. Um, I just checked earlier. We've got 270 packages now that are hosting um, documentation with us, which is, that's great. That's more than 5%. Um, we have, however, seen some issues with some of those packages because they are they generate very large doc sets, and that is something that is... That is a a feature of, of Doxy. It produces a lot of small <laughs> files, and they they add up. Um, and uh, one package in particular has is is so large and has so many files that it it is in our current setup impossible to manage to upload it within our timeouts that we currently. Can you tell me what it is in our build system? <laughs> um, it is Swift syntax. It's Apple Swift syntax package. Um, okay. Okay. And it's the nature of the package. I mean, there's it's it's not it's not the, the authors or the package's fault. It's just the nature. Yeah. If a package. I've looked at that before. Yeah. I can, I, I can see where that's coming every from. Symbol, yeah. Every symbol that's documented generates a little um, a JSON file mm -hmm. with data in it. It's like 
like a couple hundred kilobytes. It's not, but because every function has that, every every method, every attribute, it's it has one hundred and seventeen thousand files that wow. doc set and is is a, is a gigabyte large, which isn't crazy. But because we need to build the package, build the documentation, and upload it all within a maximum of fifteen minutes. That, that is just not enough time. Um, so we have to work around that sort of stuff. And we're also hoping that, um, so we are part of the documentation working group um, and we have flagged this and they are, people are aware that it's, there are some problems with the, with the size, the sheer size of Doxy's doc sets. Um, and it would help tremendously if, if, you know, that would be one way to, to you know, bring the size down a bit. But there are also things that we can do to offload that whole process and, you know, not try and sync 117,000 files in that job, yeah. but rather zip it up, upload one file elsewhere, and then have a, have a job with more time budget to deal with the upload. And that's what we're currently working on. But these are the sort of things that pop okay. up when you've shipped the feature, and then it gains adoption, and you, you see all sorts of, you know, weird... Um, Edge cases pop up. I mean, that's that's just the way it is. So that's something we're we're dealing with right now. Um, and another very interesting thing is um, that is came out of our participation in a documentation working group, and that's that's preview of upcoming Docs features. So Docs shipped uh, in its first version, I believe, last WWDC. Yeah, I think it was um, June twenty one. Yeah. Yeah. All oh, right, that's that's two WPCs yeah. So yep. ago. Yeah, of course, because in June June last year we shipped the the uh, C hosting, so it was a year old then. Um, but it's it's still pretty young. So there has have been lots of things that have been added since. Uh, and most recently, there was a a feature by Sofia Rodriguez, uh, which is a a search pop up, which is really nice. So if you are on a C works um, uh, set, you can hit. Um, I think it's just forward slash, you know, like the command pop-ups you get when you have mm -hmm. launch bar or raycast. So you have a dedicated search that you can bring up and then you just start, you know, type search as you type, you get results, wow. you know, That's through awesome. the set, which is really great. Yeah. And we've, so we've set up a preview system of that feature with a preview of Doxy. This is like a nightly five, eight, um, um okay. tool chain where we've, where we're, we're pre previewing that and we hope, we hope to get this rolled out potentially before five A chips in, I guess, the spring, right. um, and that's the sort of stuff we're working towards and hoping to be to be able to pull forward so people can can have this feature, um, you know, on the Swift package index um, as soon as possible. Are you doing anything with like quality or maintenance scores? Because that's a big thing. I use Shields.io and I like to post those badges in my repos mm -hmm. showing how right. good good of a developer, uh, what is it, a well-behaved developer I am when it comes to maintenance and quality scores. Well, I can vouch for how for how well behaved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are, thank yeah. you. Um. Um, so you want to do something like that with Swift package index? It's certainly so. I, I think one thing that is on my mind at the moment is that. We built the Swift package index where it shows metadata, and we built that, you know, a couple of years ago now. And then we decided to tackle compat build compatibility systems. So we ended up going deep into this this huge build system that we have hanging off the back of the package index, and it, it feeds compatibility results back. And then we added to that with documentation generation and. We've not. I mean, there's been various improvements, of course, but I, I, I'm conscious that we haven't done much on the actual core package page for a little while now. Um, so, for example, we did some initial work on um, dependencies, um, and we are pulling in resolved dependencies for every package, and we have that stored in the database. Um, but we're not really doing a lot with that data, um, and we also that data kind of comes with some. Um, some tricky things like, for example, if a test target declares a dependency and we're maybe showing how many dependencies a package has, do people want to know about test dependencies? I think most people are primarily concerned with what dependencies a package has that might ev eventually end up right. in their application. Products, executables, et cetera, wherever. yeah. And so there's a lot of um, interesting work to be done there on 
an, an intelligent display of how those dependencies actually affect what you bring in with a package. Okay. We, we certainly shouldn't just ignore test dependencies. That's not the way to do it. But to, to, to represent that data in a readable and a, 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 a form that lets people make intelligent decisions about what packages to use. So that's something that, that um, I think we're, we're looking to uh, get back to in the next year. Um, and as you say, you, you know, th there's a lot of these metrics that we're already pulling into the package page could be determined to give some kind of um, quick glanceable rating of how well maintained or how, you know, what, what's the, you know, how, it's, it's, I don't really want to say how good is this package, but because it's not about this, but but certainly some kind of um, glanceable metadata that says, yeah, this is something that I want to look a little deeper into. Um, and it, that can come from all sorts of stuff. Some of that will come from dependencies. Some of it will come from the, the metadata we have about how well maintained uh, packages in terms of our issues being closed, our pull requests being merged, that yeah. kind of thing. Does it have a readme file? Does it have documentation? Does it have tests? There's a lot of things that we could expose in, first of all, on the package page, and then maybe infer from some kind of quality score or something like that from it. It was something that CocoaPods um, did. They don't do it anymore, but they CocoaPods had a quality index, um, and you could, you could go to a, a little web page for every uh, pod mm -hmm. that had like five or six different metrics of like, this is something that it is doing right. This is something that's, that, that it maybe could improve on. Um, and it was things like, how complex is the README? There was a package that, the, there was um, a tool they used that would um, try and get a handle on how good a README was. Um, there's lots of possibilities for that kind of um, uh, data to be um, to be used by the package index. So uh, that's some, something I'm interested in working on. Yeah, way. I mean, one thing I always look at, and I've done this actually more with NPM, is just like, has this package actually been maintained in the last like two years? Because that's usually a decent indication that it's either a dead product or, or still active. But it sounds like, yeah, you yeah. want to add some of those metrics, which, which is awesome. I'm looking forward to that. Well, and the other thing that we won't be able to do um, is a lot of these package um, uh, ecosystems, NPM and, uh, and others, because they are both the registry and the index in most cases, like NPM, for example, is, is, is it vends the, the, the package uh, data or the, mm -hmm. the dependency data, and it is the search engine. So it can use how many people are downloading or using right, right. each dependency as some kind of indicator. Now we absolutely don't have yeah. that because we have no, we have no way to, um, to know who's using each package. We don't even know um, really you know, all we can see is is um, analytics on how many visits each package page has. Basically. Right, right. So we have none of that information. Um, maybe that's something that the registry eventually, I don't think it supports it in its current form, but maybe it could potentially start gathering some of that data. But again, there's good arguments for it. Not right, I agree. Yeah, I'm not sure that that is useful necessarily. Um, but it sounds like you have already a lot going on with Swift Package Index. It sounds like... You have a lot coming this year. Um, yeah, if people haven't been to Swift Package Index and you have a sponsorship as well, definitely take some time and uh, provide some support uh, financially and maybe put in a pull request if there's something you can fix. Well, there are many ways to support it, yeah. And and, and before I go into this, I think um, I'd like to say, or we would like to say thank you so much for um, um, featuring... Uh, the little advertisement you've been <laughs> been running for us uh that's that's very much appreciated um and we yes we do have um a github sponsors account which you can find on any of the github repositories um or on the package index page itself there's a little a little pink heart in the top uh, menu bar that you can click to go to our github sponsors um but also there's many ways to help. You could also, um, like many people have done this year, is you could uh, get involved in the development. We have a, uh, a Discord uh, server where we uh, meet with all of the contributors of um, 
uh, the contributors so far and other people who are just generally interested in what we're doing on the package index so the link to that discord is on our uh, main repositories reading and we'll file. put that as well in the show you notes of course thank you so much dave and sven for coming um, on the show i really appreciate it uh it's glad to have you both on thank you so much for your work on swift package index um i don't know what else i have to say but yeah it's been wonderful chatting thanks so much for having us on, yeah, the, thanks uh, for having on us. the show again yeah uh yeah. as a double act this where time. can people <laughs> find both of you online Best place to find me is DaveVerwa.com. Okay. Uh, links to everything from there. And Sven? I am on Mastodon these days. Find structure at Mastodon. Uh, oh God. Mastodon.social. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know the domain. <laughs> it's the, the main site. But find structure is, is the username fine as in, you know, fine and structure. F-I-N-E structure. Well, thank you so much. People can find me on Twitter at LeoGDN, Mastodon. I'm LeoGDN at c.im uh if you are listening to this podcast please take some time to uh post a review and also subscribe to the swift package index podcast as well and uh if you're watching this on youtube subscribe and like thank you so much for joining me and i look forward to talking to you again bye everyone bye